Welcome, welcome, welcome to this whole life action hour. I'm Ocean Robbins. I'm your host and guide and friend in this journey. And I am so happy that you are here right now and here for this specific action hour, which is so very dear to my heart. We all know that stress is bad for our health, for our immune system, for our resourcefulness. Um, but the good news is there are practices, there are tools that can help to calm your nervous system down, that can clear, clear your mind, that can open your heart, and that can restore your body to deeper balance. In the Food Revolution Network, we talk a lot about food and what we eat and how it impacts our mind and our body and our lives and our planet. Uh, and there's, there's more that you take in to your body and your consciousness, though, than just what you eat. How you interact with life, how you respond to life, has a lot to do with your mindset, with your attitude, with your consciousness, and with the consciousness, mindset, and attitudes that you surround yourself with and create the web of relationships you create in your life. So today, we're going to look a little bit more at the inner game and at how you can set yourself up to be resourceful and responsive and present in the context of all that we're facing in the world right now and whatever comes. And we have the perfect person here to share in that journey with us. We're here today with one of the most beloved psychotherapists and mindfulness teachers in the world, one of my greatest heroes, Tara Brock, PhD. And um, I wanna be very clear before we go further that nothing you will hear today is medical advice. This is coaching. We're sharing our best insights. And um, of course, you should always call, with, consult with a qualified healthcare professional about your specific health needs and use your own best judgment and with that as context, we're here to support you in every way that we possibly can today. This event is a project of Whole Life Club. That's Food Revolution Network's ongoing membership community. This week, we've hosted action hours with Dr. Michael Clapper on Wednesday and with Dr. Dean Ornish on Friday. And now here today, we're gonna to be joined shortly by Tara Brock. Whole Life Club paid members get access to our entire library of action hours, including transcripts and the chance to submit questions in advance for all the action hours that come in the future. They also get weekly recipes, action of the week videos, a community of support, and a lot more. So if you are interested in being a part of this membership community, please stay on at the end. I'll tell you more about how it works and what it is and um, give you an opportunity to join in today or tomorrow for a very special discount price. But now I want to focus on our time with Tara. And we're going to talk about stress and peace and fear and love and how to bring joy and a full heart into our lives. So let me introduce Tara a little bit here. She's an internationally known meditation teacher, psychologist, and author of bestsellers Radical Acceptance and Radical Compassion. Her popular weekly podcast is downloaded over 2.8 million times every month. Along with Jack Cornfield, Tara leads the Mindfulness Meditation Teacher Certification Program, serving participants in over 50 countries. Tara, welcome. Oh, a pleasure to be with you, Ocean. So glad to have you here. You know, we're in a new landscape right now as human beings on planet Earth. And in some ways, I feel like we can almost divide the world into like before COVID and after COVID because emotionally, psychologically, and physically, so much has changed. And a lot of what's changed is obvious on the outside, you know, with policies and practices and norms and all of that, right? Um, but a lot's changed on the inside too. And it, it seems to me that our ability to understand what's changed in us can help us to better respond effectively and, and just deepening our self-knowledge of what's actually going on in here. As you're serving people and communities all over the world, you must have some interesting insights. What do you think has changed on the inside of human beings alive on planet Earth right now since COVID? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a great question because it's like asking, you know, when major crisis hits, what, what goes on in us? And we seem to have two responses. And one is all of our limbic system gets triggered. We go into fight, flight, freeze. We, you know, it's like all those shadow emotions, the fear, the anger, the sometimes we turn it on ourselves and we feel like we're doing something wrong. All of that can flare up. And, and with that, you know, deep loneliness, feeling separate. But then there's the other thing that happens, which is the more evolved part of our brain, it's the more recently evolved part of our brain, 
also can kick in, which leads to us seeing patterns, seeing things we haven't seen before, fresh perspectives, you know, and with that, the heart, the heart seems to open and get tender. And one of the things Ocean I think about a lot is how in disasters, humans step forward in ways that they don't usually step forward. Yes. I, you know, I was thinking of um, Catholic worker, Dorothy Day, and she was uh, 1918. She was a child during the uh, San Francisco earthquake. And she says she was out on the streets watching how all the adults that had never even acknowledged each other were all of a sudden, without any sense of who was from what class or whatever, everybody was helping each other. And her big question was, why can't we be that way all the time? Mm. And that was her life question. Yeah. And I, so I think part of, in response to you, when there's crisis, when things fall apart, we can get hooked by really deep fears. And there's like this opportunity to wake up and evolve in ways that we hadn't thought were possible before. So we're right on the cusp of that, you know, finding those energies in us right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Rogers famously said in times of crisis, look for the helpers. There are always people helping. It's such simple advice, but it warms my heart to see that. Um, and, and yet a lot of us have a lot of fear. There's more fear all to go around. I think fear is part of the human condition all the time anyway, but right now it seems like there's a lot more fear going on. And I'm curious, um, how do you work with fear? What are the signs of it? What are the different kinds? And how do you metabolize it? Do you, do you try to dispel it? Do you love it into softening? Do you, what, what do you, what do you do with fear? Well, it's another, it's probably the key inquiry for most of us because we all, you know, fear is nature's protector. You know, every one of us is rigged to feel fear. It's intelligent and yet it can take over. And so um, one of the stories that always impacts me is Thich Nhat Hanh, Zen master, talking about, you know, when the Vietnamese refugee ships encountered a big storm or pirates or whatever, if everybody panicked, all would be lost. If everybody got possessed by fear, they'd go down. But if one person, <laughs> could find their way to calming themselves and being kind of the light, the um, open-hearted, present person, then it was possible for the boat to find its way to safety. And his injunction to us was, please be that person. And so I think mm. one of the, the invitations right now is we know how contagious fear is. And also there's a real contagion when there's somebody calm when there's somebody mm. that is very tender and caring. And can we be that person? Mm. And there are actual trainings that quiet the limbic system, <laughs> calm the limbic system, and actually help us to find more balance and freedom in the midst. And for mm. me, it, there's two, two basic uh, garden varieties of how to do that. And one, is that we find ways to ground ourselves, to slow down our breathing. I mean, just the simplest practice of breathing and counting to perhaps five, and then breathing out and counting to five, the kind of a long match breath. There's so much science that shows how it, it actually, in a few minutes, the sympathetic nervous system does calm down. And if you're practicing it, actually imagine with that slow out breath that you're letting go. You're letting go of tension and tightness. You're letting go of the worry thoughts. You're letting go of the tightness in the heart. So that's just a simple example that if we practice uh, can help us to calm down the fear. And the other whole category of practices is learning to be present with which means that, well, as one great sage put it, asking that question, what am I unwilling to feel? And have, courage is the willingness to feel what we don't wanna feel. Like having the courage just to breathe with the fear, sometimes just saying, thank you for trying to protect me, but I'm okay right now. Yeah. But just noticing it, naming it and breathing with it can help 
to really find a sense of balance with it. Mm, thank you. One of the things I am present to is how much suffering there is in our world. It's always present for me, actually. You know, we have children dying of hunger, maybe more now, but there have been an unbelievable number that we can hardly comprehend dying of hunger every day on this planet. Um, but right now with so many people unemployed, with so many people wondering how they're gonna pay rent, with so many people accumulating mountains of debt, with so many people afraid for their health or the health of their loved ones, afraid for the survival of their businesses, there's just so much to stress us out. And um, what I, what I uh, wonder is uh, how do you keep a heart of compassion uh, stay in connection to the world around you without getting overwhelmed. Like, I, I feel like a lot of us are afraid that if we really take in the suffering around us, we'll just get lost there. We'll, we'll kind of drown in the ocean of suffering that is part of our collective experience. And uh, I don't want to drown, but I also don't want to be disconnected and separate and lose the wisdom that comes from resourceful connection to life. I mean, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're not connected to something, how can you respond to it effectively? How can you integrate the wisdom that comes from that connection? And so I'm curious how you, how you hold that. Yeah, well, I think for many of us, the suffering is so big right now. I mean, that, you know, it's such an unequal impact of this virus where, we have those that can least afford to have it happen to them getting uh, decimated financially and those that are most vulnerable dying. And the other day I was listening to um, something on the prisons where I heard one inmate say, help, we're dying, we matter. You know, it's like these forgotten parts of the world that are just a setup to, to get it. So. So for me, part of it, Ocean, is the willingness to actually extend myself so my heart can get touched because mm -hmm. there's a strong conditioning to try to keep ourselves comfortable. And um, so just to stay in touch with the friends who are most lonely and the, those that are most afraid of never, never feeling financially secure again and those who are most struggling, to keep my heart open to it but also to every day on purpose, remember the goodness here, you know, remember, see the beauty around me, remember what I'm grateful for, you know, feel the heart connection with a loved one. And there's a lot of research that shows, you know, that we have this survival negativity bias to fixate on the negative. Yeah. So part of a path of healing is on purpose to save her life on purpose because the negative stuff, as one friend says, we're Velcro for the negative and Teflon for the positive. <laughs> so <laughs> it, what that means is that we have to be open to the negative or else we're pushing something away, we'll push away the good. But we yeah. also have to on purpose take in the good. And that literally means when you have a moment where you see a starry sky or you see the gleam in a child's eye to actually pause and take three full breaths and just let your body mind register the delight the wonder take the time because that way it actually sinks into our unconscious uh, memory our, our, our long-term memory otherwise it just slides by us so yeah take in what's difficult and take in what's good Okay, thank you. We know that gratitude is good for us. There's a lot of studies that show that, that it doesn't just make the half full glass uh, look better. It actually makes the glass fuller. It literally makes things get better. That the experience of gratitude, the practice of gratitude is correlated statistically in studies with more long lasting marriages, with higher self esteem, with with longer life expectancy, yeah. with lower yeah. rates of illness. And uh, it puts your immune system in a state of presence and resourcefulness rather than reactivity and fear. And um, so uh, 
how do you cultivate gratitude even when things kind of stink? <laughs> <laughs> like, like yeah. you just talked about a few things. Can you share yeah. some more specific practices for bringing that in? Yeah. Well, I mean, the most well-known is writing three things you're grateful for each day. Just have a gratitude partner and send it. Even if you're not in the mood, just write them. Especially even if, if you're not in the mood. Exactly right. <laughs> you know, let it be an abstraction, but write them down. And then, you yeah. know, my husband and I have... a a few times a week, we purposely meditate together and then do a meditative sharing. And we always start our sharing by saying what we're grateful for. And I have had so many times, Ocean, when I'm, you know, I've been processing something heavy and the last thing I'm in the mood to do, it's like, it feels fake. Yeah. But I will just start naming them and naming them. And I find my heart starts softening. And because deep down I am grateful, I start connecting with a deeper place in me. And then it's not like the fear or the anger goes away. It's more like there's space for it. It's like I've become more ocean-like and there's room for the waves. More ocean-like. Cool. <laughs> it's, it's quite the well, I want to become more tarot like, so that's all good. Uh, okay, we'll trade. My, my wife and I have a practice sometimes when we're actually in a conflict, or which is to just stop and each say three things we appreciate about each other. And mm -hmm. I, one, what I notice is that usually when we suggest it, it's kind of like we're putting the brakes on whatever grouchy meanness might be in the space between us. And a part of me is resistant and it, it, it feels like stress because I'm not in gratitude at that moment. But it is amazing going back and forth. We each do one and then two and then three. Um, what happens is that feeling seen through the eyes of gratitude makes me feel more like the person that is being appreciated. And suddenly I'm like, oh yeah, I did do that. That's cool. And I remember who I am in a way through the eyes of love from another. And as I express my appreciations, I become more conscious. And, and by the end of that, I really know at a cellular level that we're on the same team. And yeah. I remember a bit of who I am and it, it totally changes the conversation. And then we might go right back into whatever it is we were working with, but we're in a totally new vantage point. And it strikes me that when we uh, feel gratitude for others or for life, we're, we're not just affecting us, but in the same way that I'm moved when my wife appreciates me, that at some energetic level, we are actually expanding that in the universe that we're appreciating. What you appreciate, appreciates. Not just in your experience, but it actually is an investment in making more of it in the universe. Do you see it that way as well? Absolutely. And I love your practice with your wife. It's a beautiful one. And often one of the most, the deepest gift we can give another person is to mirror their goodness. It really is because it brings it out of them. It's like we all forget. We all get into what I call the trance of unworthiness where we really in some way feel flawed and other, our, our loved ones can help us remember who we are. So having, and it doesn't even have to be somebody really close to you. If you say something kind to another person that's appreciative that you don't know so well, but you mean it, it helps to bring out their goodness. So that's a beautiful strategy in conflict and not in conflict. I find there's two ways when we're in, in a kind of a, um, at odds with another person to work. And one is what you said, where we just start right in and first remember the bigger picture of who they are and who we are, because any communication will be, it'll be safer. There's a container that makes it safer. The other is to take a time out, you know, take some time on your own. Um, it's, it's been shown in research that if we have just a little bit of time, our sympathetic nervous system does calm down and we have more perspective. But not only that, during that time out, go to where you're angry or upset and then ask yourself what's underneath it. You know, what hurts? Because inevitably underneath our anger, there's either going to be hurt or fear. And if we can get to the vulnerable place that has been triggered and actually bring some kindness to ourselves, just mm. seeing that vulnerability and being with it, what happens is our lens becomes clearer and more open. And then we can think of the other person and not just say what we appreciate, 
but actually feel it. We can remember their goodness and we can also see the other person and remember and sense what might be upsetting for them through their eyes. One of the greatest gifts, it's Henry David Thoreau said, one of the great miracles is to see another person, um, you know, see through their eyes for just a moment. Yeah. So, so either way is good, either to start right in with the gratitude or start right in by getting in touch with the very real pain, but find under it where the vulnerability is. Mm. Because that then opens our hearts when we open to ourselves, then we actually are in more authentic relationship with each other. Yeah. So when, when things are, um, when things are tough outside of us, it tends to evoke whatever is tough inside of us, whatever traumas or heartbreaks or sufferings we've been through often at very formative ages tend to get stimulated by external circumstance. So if, if you feel um, lonely, it may touch into core loneliness from childhood, for example. And um, I'm curious how you work with trauma, how you work with, how, how do you bring mindfulness and compassion and love to the parts of ourselves that are terrified, that um, are lo lost, that are desperate, that can sometimes come up in times like these? Well, first off to say that's exactly what's happening. Whatever the undercurrents are in our emotional life, they are now getting spiked and triggered and exacerbated. And a huge number of us have trauma. Trauma is really widespread. <laughs> so there's a lot of feelings of trauma and, and intense emotions. And so one way of working with it is a compassion practice where we um, become aware of the feelings. And I really encourage people to put their hand on their heart and to breathe with what's going on and to send a message of kindness. And it, for me, over the years, it could be something as simple as, you know, it's okay, sweetheart, to something much more like, you know, you're safe right at this moment, or I'm here yeah. with you, or I'm not leaving, but send a message of kindness. And if you can't offer yourself kindness, then imagine someone you trust, someone you love, it could be a living person, grandmother, or child, or a partner, it could be a spiritual figure, it could be your dog, could be mother earth, mother nature, but imagine some larger source of loving and just imagine it pouring right into the scared place. Mm. So that, that's one approach ocean is bringing loving kindness, compassion right to the place inside you. Yeah. The other is one that I thought maybe I'd, I'd lead as a, as a meditation that includes that, but actually involves more of a mindfulness practice. So at some point, I'm glad to lead it, but yes. it's, uh, it's a meditation called RAIN that my most recent book is kind of a whole guide on how to do it because it gives us an easy to remember tool for when all of a sudden we get hijacked by difficult emotion. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We'll, we'll do that later. Okay, I'll, I'll ask you. Sure. Um, I, I just want to highlight something Tara said here. In order to um, send love to a terrified place inside, we have to also be connected to a resourceful place or a witness place that isn't purely 100% identified with the terrified place. And um, it's my experience that what makes us able to resolve or heal or integrate historical trauma, pain, or suffering from our history is the fact that we're actually not there now. We actually have a new moment and a new opportunity. And that awareness is part of what can enable us not to just be re-stimulated and go back right where we were, but actually to be here now and bring love there. And I think that sometimes when external circumstances remind us in any way of historical traumas, we can have the feeling just like we're there again. And the witness place that can say, oh, but I have resources I didn't have then. I have wisdom, I have presence that I didn't have then. Uh, it can be how it becomes not just a reactivation of something terrible, but actually a healing event. 
in the long story arc of our lives. And that love that Tara is talking about bringing that kindness, oh, I hear you, I see you, I love you. When I can bring that place in, then, then the little one inside who is terrified suddenly gets what it desperately needs, which is some loving attention. Um, I just like, just a short comment on that. Yeah. That you're absolutely right that when we're in trauma, it feels like we're living inside the past experience. And one of the best ways to get present, and therapists call it grounding, and it's just exactly that, is to feel the weight of your body on the ground and feel if you're sitting the weight of your bottom against the couch. And if you're looking around, see the tree outside the window and actually very concretely and specifically notice how you're right here. Um, notice the feeling of this breath and now this breath and the texture of what you're wearing because we need to use our senses to get back into now so we can actually be a witness and offer care and grounding mm -hmm. is a really powerful pathway yes thank you is it ethical is it respectful is it kind is it compassionate to feel joy to feel even ecstasy when people so many people are scared or hurting. This is something that's been with me lately because um, I, I feel like since COVID hit, I've been so present to the, the suffering that's all around me and have felt like there was kind of a lid on my willingness to really feel satisfied or happy with anything because I don't want to be disrespectful to what's going on, right? And yet, the truth is that I feel like my core nature is fairly ebullient, like it's fairly happy. And um, I, I'm actually at my best when I'm open to that, <laughs> you know, when I'm willing to have joy. And I'm wondering how you hold that. Like, is there some way that your joy needs to be tempered, you know, when others are hurting? And what about when a whole lot of others are hurting? I don't feel like joy ever needs to be tempered. I don't think your inner um, ebullience and your, th that spirit that shines ever needs to be tampered with. It's more a matter of if there's any not looking at what else is here. So the Taoists say, let's open to the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows by all means open to the joys. But just to be very honest with yourself, if there's any habit pattern of not paying attention in a way that would block you or shield you from other people's pain. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, for most of us, that is our conditioning, that we're afraid to feel pain. And so we have often a lot of unconscious and some conscious strategies where we move our attention in other directions. We either get distracted or we overeat or we oversleep or we get workaholic or whatever it mm -hmm. is but it's in a way it's a pulling away from that presence with the realness of what another's feeling and so when i'm training myself and others it's like full blown when there's beauty and goodness and wonder absolutely savor it absolutely mm -hmm. because we need mm -hmm. it because it creates the spaciousness that allows us to include the difficult waves. But when we find we're not fully attending to the difficult waves, lean in. And here, yeah. here's like, there's simple ways to lean in, which is when you sense somebody's having a hard time, in your own mind, wonder, so where does it hurt? You know, yeah. what is it like for you, really? And try to do that role reversal where you really go inside how another person's experiencing it. And just to know that everyone we meet is fighting a hard battle, as they say, to be willing to look towards that is really um, mm. just, it's becoming whole, not, not, in, not pushing away anything. Yeah. Right now, at this moment, there are millions of activities happening in your body. There are cells dividing and transferring information and chemicals and all kinds of things. Your immune system is functioning. Your body's making white blood cells and your heart's beating and you know, your brain is firing neurons and millions of things literally in one second. And we tend to focus on the things that are 
broken, like, or painful, right? And we, we should focus sometimes on the weakest link in the chain because often that's a place that needs our attention. It's calling for some attention, some love, some, maybe some change in behavior. But I, it, I don't wanna lose all that's going right. Like if I have a sore toe, suddenly that toe becomes like a central part of my life. Let's suppose I bang it into something and like I'm totally focused on that toe. At that same moment, I've got nine other toes that are just happy as could be, but I'm not focusing on them, right? And so it, I, I just want to invite us to remember that at any given moment, it's all true. At any given moment, there are things that are broken. There are things that are dying. There are people that are dying. There are parts of our cells that are dying. There are parts of our bodies that are, that are uh, aging. There are also places that are regenerating, that are recovering, that are restoring, that are healing, that are being born. And somehow in the totality of that, I feel like, Tara, you're calling us to more aliveness, to more embrace of everything that is. Yes. And there are ways that we get fixated that it's not just that we're, it's good that we're paying attention to what's real. We're actually fixated in a narrow way. And that does not serve if, mm -hmm. all, if I'm paying attention to that toe and I'm telling myself stories of now I'm not going to be able to go running this week and that's going to screw up the rhythm I've developed and then I'm going to gain weight. And then, you know, if, if we go into the storyline, we're doomed. Yeah. So one, so one of the powers of training and meditation is to get the knack of seeing the stories we're making, of how we're interpreting things, of how we're making ourselves wrong or someone else wrong or we're predicting a bad future. And just saying, thank you very much, but I don't need to believe this right now. Yeah. If we step back and then the, pay, the tone that's painful, the toe that's painful, it's just, you know, a sense of throbbing or aching and we can include that. And then our mind naturally lets it come and lets it go and we move on. We don't get hooked. What hooks us is the thinking. So that's the trick is that if we can wake up out of the trance of the virtual reality of thinking, then we can open to the pain and the pleasure and be living from a much more oceanic space of awareness. It's that oceanic again. again. <laughs> there she goes again. Yes. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, so I want to ask you about compassion and particularly compassion for difficult people. We all have the ones in our lives that kind of get us triggered or that bug us in different ways and, and also maybe in our political world and wider, wider circles. And uh, it, it seems that uh, um, you were talking about how we fixate sometimes. Well, it feels to me like we sometimes fixate not just on physical pain, but also on things in the world that aren't how we want them to be. Um, and that becomes a source of agitation and distress. Can you talk a little bit about how you how you draw boundaries internally or externally uh, and how you interact with people inwardly, how you interact in your own heart and consciousness relative to people that might be doing things you find um, reprehensible, you find unacceptable. Yeah. Uh I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I've had so many people and part of what's coming out of this pandemic is a huge amount of rage towards leadership and a huge amount of tension often in, in our own partnerships and friends. I mean, a lot of tension comes up and I'll speak personally here, Ocean, where, um, you know, in addition to my heart breaking for those that are suffering the most, I felt a lot of anger towards the ineptitudes and incompetencies of the leadership in the country I'm in. And so how to work with that anger because it creates distance and it makes my heart tight and so on. And what I do is when I'm, and it comes often when I'm listening to news is I turn off everything and I take a pause. And then I feel the anger and I have the swirling thoughts and I step out of the thoughts and I come right into my body. And that's a really important thing. If you wanna get out of the hook of angers, come into your body. I let the anger be all that it is, and I can find under the anger that there's fear. You know, I'm afraid that there's just going to be more suffering because we're not taking the measures we need to take. So I open to the fear, and I find under the fear that there's a lot of sadness and grieving for all the loss. And under the grieving, I find care. Mm. 
And if I can take the time to bring a mindful presence underneath the thoughts to just where my heart cares, then I can regard the others I've been focusing my blaming on and just know that others are wounded in their own ways. They're, they're living out of their hurts and fears. And so I'm not so fixated in blame. And then that care can act, activate me. And I can, you know, for me personally, it's, it's motivated me to engage in a, in a whole initiative for more compassionate leadership. And you can see it on my homepage. But I think the point people are afraid, well, if I'm not angry, then I won't act and do anything. And that's not true. Uh, one of my friends says that anger is initiatory but it's not transformative. So we need it. it. It energizes us. In fact, there's never been a movement in history against oppression that hasn't been motivated, doesn't have the energy of anger. But then to have a real healing transformation, a revolution, as you might say, it needs to then transform into what's under it, which is care. Yeah. And if we can feel the care, we can take actions in our society, in our political world, and in our relationships that are wise and they are boundary, but they're not coming out of hate or anger. Yeah. So I hope that's helpful because I, and it's not a one shot, by the way, you have to keep doing it. <laughs> but it's very freeing and, and it does lead to action, but much more intelligent action. Mm, thank you. We've got a lot of questions from our Whole Life Club members, and I want to get to some of those now. So I'll, I'll share some of them. Uh, David asked, he said, I'm fairly new to meditation, practicing for a little over a month and loving it. Someone told me I should not meditate after eating, but I tend to meditate right after lunch. Am I shortchanging myself in doing this? Well, thank you, David. It's, it's a good question because in a way, I think of meditation as a life process that right this moment I'm um, in talking meditation and that we can walk and meditate, we can eat and meditate, we can, you know, take showers and meditate. So meditation is a way of being present with your experience. Now as a training, there are sometimes you'll find and you just keep experimenting, but sometimes you'll find you that it it supports your meditation. There's more clarity, more presence. A lot of people find that after they eat, especially if they're not eating in a really healthy way, that they have a sinking feeling, that they get sleepy. So then the meditation has to be with that sinking sleepy feeling, which is okay, but it might not be for you the best way to train, but that's, it's not bad because you need to learn to be with that too. So do find out, do keep on exploring what supports your practice most, but know that there's nothing that you can be doing in this world that can't be included as part of a, a meditation and presence. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia said, I'm just figuring out that I live a pretty stressful life. Being unaware or just denying stress and anxiety has cost me my health. How do I recognize signs of stress? Where do I start on this journey? Usually signs of stress show up when you're having unpleasant experiences in your body and in your emotional body. So if you look, uh, look through your day and sense where you're feeling most anxious, when you're feeling uh, a lot of thoughts that are going on of blame of yourself or blame of others, where you've left your body and you're just obsessing in some way, the big signs of going into what I call trance, a stress trance, are that we leave our body, we get lost in thoughts, and often we're judging. So they're great indicators, and not to then add on judgment. That's an invitation to do what I call the sacred pause, where you just stop, and you give yourself the gift of just pausing and saying, okay, this is stressful, stress is here. And you might even whisper what else you're aware of in those moments. You might even say, okay, anxious, worrying, you know, fearful, angry. And you'll find that if you pause and just mentally whisper whatever's there, you start waking up to a space that's bigger than the stressful trans person and there's good research on this. I think it was UCLA where they found that when you can name 
mental notation of what's going on, it actually quiets the limbic system huh. and it wakes up the frontal cortex, which is the site of mindfulness and compassion and executive functioning. So just that pause, name what's going on, few deep breaths, and it'll help. Mm. I find it uh, useful sometimes to focus on what what some might call the unarguable truth, which is to say that I can have stories about feelings and what's happening. I feel this way because this happened to me and I can get lost in the story. And if I return to what's more unarguable, which might be sensations, I'm feeling heaviness in my chest. I'm feeling tension in my neck. I'm feeling uh, a, a, a gravitational pull down. I'm, I'm feeling uh, bouncy or vibrating feelings in my belly. I'm feeling, you know, whatever it is, uh, I find that there's something very integrative about that. And um, especially like in communication with my partner, when I speak to sensations, there's no argument going on. It's not like you didn't take out the trash and now I'm mad and you never take out the trash and I'm upset about it. And, you know, this triggers my feeling. I just feel like you, you never take care of me or you're irresponsible, right? Suddenly I'm there. Instead of like, I'm noticing agitation, stress, I'm feeling weight in my belly, I'm feeling, you know, and we can talk about that. And then we can go to, and the story I'm making up is because of all this, but I don't want to get lost in this story. Um, do, you, do you find also that body sensations are useful in self-understanding or in communication? Yeah, well, just the same way that we get caught in a suffering trance when we leave our body, get lost in thoughts and get into judgment, the return is to let go of the thoughts and stories, come back to our body and mm -hmm. be right here. You know, there's this another bit of research that an emotion has an arc and it really lasts for 1.5 minutes. The only reason our emotions stick around longer is because we keep having thoughts that fuel them. So if you can get out of your story and into your body, you actually interrupt the, uh, the persistence of the emotion and you get a lot more access to your natural intelligence and to your heart. So yeah, wow. get out of the story and into the body. Now here's the challenge to it, Ocean, which is the more traumatized we've been, the more difficult it is to be in the body. So I've often given this recipe of, you know, come out of your thoughts, come into your body. And people say, yeah, but I don't, I can't feel much in my body. So I just want to name that to be really patient because you can actually train yourself to wake up through your body. Um, a lot of my guided meditations are a gentle scan through the body to start waking up awareness in the body, but it just takes some practice because we have practiced leaving our body <laughs> for decades sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So be kind and gentle about that. But I have to say that when people come to a meditation retreat, probably the number one takeaway is I realized I don't have to believe my thoughts. <laughs> I don't have to believe them. And that, <laughs> that's like a gateway to liberation if we wow. don't have to believe our thoughts. Wow. You know, you yeah. just said something that I've never heard before that makes complete sense and that is kind of a game changer for me. You said that emotions only last, was it five or 10 minutes? Like that, that's one, the life cycle? 1.5 minute. One oh, 1. 1.5 minutes. That's the life cycle of an emotion yes. in response to a stimuli. And exactly. all that follows from that is our own thoughts that, that keep it going, kind of. And right. uh, fascinating. Now, I'm sure there are some things, like the loss of a loved one, that you're probably going to feel sadness for more than 1.5 minutes. But uh, so, so how do you hold that, actually, in, in sure. terms of sure. timing? Um, our thoughts actually perpetuate the sadness. If, our th if we're not thinking thoughts at all, that grief becomes a feeling of heaviness and swell and achiness. And if we just really let it be there and come and go, we find that grief is not a solid state. It comes, it goes, it comes, it goes. If we're not doing a lot of thinking about the past and, the f and how we'll never be able to live without this person again, it's the thoughts that make it seem like a solid state. And 
it's not like we're trying to get rid of the emotions mm -hmm. that, you know, it's like, let them come for the 1.5 minute, let it, let it retreat some, you notice, the, you know, you're looking at the green tree and you're in that moment and then the grief again. And it's okay that it comes and goes where we get hooked is it turns more solid state because of our thinking. And then our whole body mind contracts and we're yeah. feeling in prison. Yeah. 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 Is fear an emotion in that same way or is it something different? Fear is a basic affect and it becomes emotional and locked in because of fear thoughts. We have many, many worry thoughts that keep on stimulating it. But all emotions are, com are a combination of thoughts and feelings that keep cycling. Okay. So um, absent, like if with a totally clear mind, let's say, would fear, maybe you would feel fear at a moment because there's a thing to be afraid of, but are you saying that that will move through just like any other emotion, like the rain comes and it pours down and then it's sunny again, That's that right. in the landscape of our ecosystem, emotions could actually flow very quickly, but then our minds become like a mountain that holds the cloud and doesn't let it go. And then it just kind of gets stuck there and rains and rains and rains forever. That's how the weather system locks in. It's, yeah. You're naming it beautifully. And I use the weather as, as I think the best example. It's like, we can't control our emotions. They're meant to be happening. And they mm -hmm. have, and they've got intelligent messages and we need to do some thinking. It's not like we want to vanquish our thoughts, but when you start meditating, you start noticing what thoughts are serving you you can really ask that question. Is this in some way serving uh, joy, mm. freedom, awakening, authenticity? Or is this actually fueling a sense of a separate self that's limited and not okay? And, mm. and it doesn't mean you can all of a sudden drop it, but just seeing that actually opens you to a space that's larger than the thoughts and you're not quite yeah. as caught. So here's, here's a tip I find useful with that is it a thought I've thought before? And if it's a thought that I've thought a lot of times before, then I have a pretty good idea where it ends up. Yeah. Does it contribute to me feeling more resourceful and happy and alive and connected? Or does it contribute to more fear and stuckness or, or agitation or anger? And I'll be honest, most of my cyclical repeated thoughts are bad habits. Yeah. At least for me. I mean, I do. Uh, yeah, I have some cycles, some habits that think to like, what's beautiful about this moment? What do I love? You know, <laughs> but honestly, most of the boring stuff that just goes around and around and around tends to drag my consciousness down. And it's the fresh thoughts that are born of creative interaction that are born of being alive in a moment that bring me joy and aliveness. It's true. Um, part of our whole survival system is that we have, our nervous system has this kind of existential fear about what's around the corner. I mean, we're, mo we're often tensing around what's around the corner, is it gonna be too much? And we keep generating thoughts that are anticipating what can go wrong. And those are the familiar thoughts. And one of the most profoundly freeing things in the world is as you said, just to get it, okay, I've thought this before, it doesn't serve and sense the option you have the choice to direct your attention somewhere else and there really really is a lot of freedom in that yeah thank you kim said i can't lose weight because my system is under stress lots of allergies demanding job and a child of never quite childhood of never quite good enough i've always eaten well compared to the standard north american diet so I did soda, chips, and fast food decades ago. I've significantly reduced min meat intake with the help of Food Revolution recipes. But what else can I do? I do exercise regularly, though not as much as I used to. Uh, and so I think there's a few questions here, but specifically Kim is asking about weight loss and the belief that weight loss is tied to system stress. Which it often is. I mean, often what... When we're stressed, we want to get away from the unpleasantness, the rawness of feeling like something's wrong. And one of the earliest ways that we learn to calm that is through food. And we learned it when it's pre-verbal learning. So it's very deep in us to reach for a certain combo. And it's usually, I mean, it's often sugars and fats and so on, but it doesn't have to be. And so 
not only, I mean, you're doing all the right things in the sense of uh, adapting your diet, making it healthy, doing the exercise. The last piece you can do, which I think is the most uh, kind of deep rooted, is to start doing the practices that help you to free yourself from the fear reactivity, from the stress itself. And that's where meditation can help. I mean, if you add, and, and by the way, there's a lot of research uh, that connects meditation with being able to reduce addictive behavior. And that's what I, I ended up doing my doctoral dissertation on it, you know, working with um, binge eating. And also uh, for my early years, uh, 18 through 22, really struggled with overeating, which is why I chose that dissertation. Meditation makes a huge difference. It really helps you when things are raw, it increases what's called affect tolerance. In other words, it allows you to become more spacious so there's room for the rawness. You don't have to try to get away through some, health, some unhealthy habit. Mm. Let's go a little bit deeper on that because so many people are struggling right now with binge eating, uh, be finding themselves on the wrong end of an empty bag of cookies or an empty bag of chips a little too often feeling drawn in, especially in times of stress to so-called comfort foods. And we've learned as a society to take comfort in foods that actually in the long run create the very opposite of comfort. They create suffering and misery and pain. Yeah. But in the short run, we associate them with ease, with satisfaction, with connection. So the next time our participants find themselves craving foods that are not in their best interest, whether that be a late night draw towards a slice of whole wheat bread with hummus, or that be a binge on raw cookie dough or donuts, whatever it is, we're all in different places, but we all can relate to this. What do we need to remember, Tara? Okay, a couple things. One is when the craving comes up, pause and just commit yourself to pausing and to naming that it's a craving and to feeling it in your body and then to sense, you know, to hold it kindly and to sense if there's some other way that you can act, behave, pay attention that might in that moment satisfy the craving so you don't have to go for what's so unhealthy. That's, that's one is to interrupt. Even if you interrupt for 10 seconds and then you go ahead and have the cookie dough it's still an interruption. And I wanna just slow down here and say, we have neural pathways that are really well trod. And in the uh, science on breaking habits, one of the ways to do it is to interrupt the pattern at some point, and at least in some way, bring in something different. Now that doesn't mean the ultimate outcome is gonna be that you don't have the food that you've been craving. But the interruption gives you a little bit more space and a little bit more choice. And what I find is that people, maybe one out of four times, will do something different. Instead of, instead of having the cookie dough, they'll call somebody that they really wanna to talk to, or, they will, or they'll huddle with a novel that's really not at all enhancing, but better than eating the, <laughs> better than the cookie dough. So that's one piece is to interrupt the pattern, pause, breathe, feel it, sense what the substitute might be. And the second is when you do go ahead and have the cookie dough to totally forgive yourself. Because what locks in a habit is the feeling of shame and self judgment that we wrap it with. That's what nails, puts the nails in the coffin. Because what happens is then we feel worse about ourselves, that creates more stress, and that actually fuels the next binge. So interrupt during and afterwards interrupt your pattern by actually just saying, forgiven, forgiven. This is hard. This is, I'm not alone in this. This is probably the most challenging addictive behavior that most people in our culture experience. Mm. You're not alone. So be forgiving. And that itself plants the seeds for new behaviors. Thank you. A couple more questions that I want to get to that practice that we talked about earlier. So Sarah said, given that depression is one of, one of the leading mental disorders in the modern world, what are your main strategies or practices for dealing with depression? 
Yeah, depression's huge and anxiety's huge. And with depression, meditation can be really, really helpful. So I'm gonna name a few different types. The gratitude practices are numero uno because there's so much research that if you just kind of commit yourself to writing down those three things you're grateful for a day, it does have an impact on depression. Um, the other is to do mindful activity, which is, you know, depression, it gets broken up when we're more physically active and we're more engaged and the way it perpetuates itself is to sink us into isolation and inactivity. So anything you can do where you're out of care for life because you want to feel more life, convince yourself and dedicate it to your life to do that extra walk or to attend right now and online, whatever with other people where you're being real, you know, but something. And then with meditation, uh, very, very helpful to do the loving kindness practice. And again, these are meditations. Um, I've got you know countless free meditations on my website and they're all over the internet. So um, the loving kindness practice is simply to sense that it's hard and to in some way offer care to yourself in the midst of that. And that can help to soften the heart. It's much better to feel sad than depressed. As soon as depression shifts into sadness, there's a kind of melting of some of the armoring going on. And uh, there's a book called The Wild Edge of Sorrow, which I really love. And it basically says sorrow, we all need, sorrow is a natural human response to loss. And when we start having the courage to feel our sorrow and our grief, we actually begin the healing process. So I hope that's helpful. Beautiful, yes, thank you. Okay, Shannon said, similar to most Americans, I'm on devices almost eight to 10 hours a day. I can imagine this is having an impact on my happiness. Do you have any suggestions for disconnecting from technology? We each have to find, experiment and find a way to do it, but we need to do it. I mean, we're still in the, the beginning, we're in the infancy of finding out um, the challenges and the dis-ease that comes from you know being so in relationship with a with a screen um, my way is that i don't turn on anything and i won't look at email or do anything until i've already exercised and meditated and mm. it just it's just good for me to have a structure so one once i and my exercise is usually i'll go for a hike by the river so getting out into nature so it's like I have to have that coming home to an intimacy with life in a very direct, multi-dimensional way before I will go into the cyber world. And similarly, at the end of the day, um, I cut out early enough so there's a real chunk of time between then and bed to go for an evening walk or to do an evening meditation or just hang out with Jonathan, my husband, but create some guidelines and rules. There are days that I don't, I have one day a week that I don't go online at all. I mean, that's just my commitment to myself. And um, during the day, I turn off email for long chunks because I can't be creative if I'm uh, fractured, my mm. attention is fractured. So yeah. I'm just giving you my ways, but I think we all need to find them. I'm curious, Ocean, how you do that one. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm a work in progress, like, like we all are. Yeah. Um, I think that for me, there is something about being fully present wherever I am that's critical. As a father, when I'm with my kids, I want to be with them. I don't want to be thinking about emails or work stuff. I don't want to be therefore checking. And actually, our son, Bodhi, is very diligent now um, about calling me out. So if he sees me on my phone, start to check emails, he's like, what are you doing? And I... <laughs> <laughs> and I will say, you know, oh, I'm, you know, checking emails. And he's like, oh, so that's more important than your children? <laughs> <laughs> like, no, you're the most important person in the world to me. He's like, well, then start acting like it. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Oh, yeah, he's sort of taken it on as a little project, but I appreciate it, you know, and we, t we joke about it and I act like I'm an addict. I'm like, oh, I've got to get my emails. And he's like, <laughs> he just smiles. And I'm like, oh, thank you for helping me remember who I am you know? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I do want to put out a word because this is for me as well as for everybody who's thinking, oh my gosh, I don't have time to not to draw those boundaries. Like there's too much going on. I've got to be able to respond. And 
here's the thing I want us to remember. Have you ever had an hour where you just got so much done because you were super clear and present and everything just flowed? And have you ever had a whole entire day where you feel like you accomplished nothing, you just spun your wheels? Or worse yet, you made a big mistake because it took days to clean up? Well, the kinds of uh, practices that Tara is talking about here can put us into a state of consciousness where we are more apt to make wise choices and to be present and resourceful and responsive in the time we spend. So I suspect, Tara, that after your exercise and your morning meditation, when you do sit down at your desk and engage with technology, that you are better able to uh, measure twice, cut once, to bring wisdom and clarity into your interactions in the virtual world because you had that time to center and presence. And I, I think for me, that's true. I'm now in the habit daily of exercising every day and sometimes some form of meditation practice. I don't have a formal sit down right now, although I have at times in my life, but I do take time to watch my breath. I usually stay in bed for a while after I wake up to just mm -hmm. be, reflect on my dreams, connect with my beloved, whatever it is, so that I can attune to what's happening in this organism. And so then by the time I'm at my desk, I feel like I'm ready now. I, I, I have a self to bring to the table. <laughs> and instead of feeling like the world is bombarding me. So I do think those kinds of boundaries can be helpful and uh, perhaps even very helpful. And I, I thank you. Most of us need them, um, but not to turn it into something that we're um, then going to use to criticize ourselves. Yeah. You know, I'm, but I am aware that very few of us are going to be at the end of our lives saying, God, I wish I'd spent more time online, you know? <laughs> like True. I, and here we are in the world <laughs> when there's so much uh, physical distancing happening, when, when a lot of us are spending more time online. So this is a really pertinent thing. And yet the truth is that we can use online to connect us to our, to our core, to our being, to our bodies. And we're gonna practice that right now because we're all having an online community experience here. Tara, I would love if you could share in the RAIN practice that you alluded to earlier, tell us what it is and then actually walk us through for a few minutes of practice together. There are people all over the world that feel this connection, just like we were in the room with Tara, we're in the virtual room with Tara right now. Uh, we want to invite you to guide us through this this moment of journey of self-connection and, and love connection. Mm, well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, RAIN is an acronym, and the uh, letters are R is recognize, A is allow, I is investigate, and N is nurture. And when we get stuck, whether we're stuck in uh, craving or we're stuck stuck in fear or we're stuck in hatred or anger, whatever it is, if we take time for even a light rain, it'll give us more access to our resourcefulness. And if we take time for a more full rain, it can really unroot some very deep patterns. So I'm, gonna sh I'm just going to walk you through it without much more to do and um, begin by inviting you wherever you are wherever you're listening from, just to take a moment to find a comfortable way to sit and to close your eyes and to come into stillness. And you might, as we talked about earlier, become aware of your body breathing and even take that nice, deep, full in breath to collect your attention, filling the chest and the lungs. And then a slow out breath and sense with the out breath that you really can let go, letting go, letting go. And then a nice full in breath again, breathing in, filling the chest and the lungs. And a slow, even out breath, feel the breath as it exits the nostrils, letting go. And then now allowing the breath to resume in its natural rhythm Take some moments to scan your life and sense where you feel you get reactive, where you encounter difficulty and get stuck in some way, feeling angry or hurt, or maybe you turn on yourself and go to war with yourself in judgment, where you might get caught in anxiety. So bring up a situation that might trigger you. And for the purposes of exploring the power of rain, let the situation be real. 
Like really notice what is it about this that's getting to you. And if there's another person there, visualize their face and hear their voice and what they're saying. Or if it's you and you're working with an addictive behavior, just imagine yourself doing that behavior, feeling really caught in it, and perhaps the shame that goes with it. And sensing the worst part of it, what you're most afraid of, what's most upsetting or distressful about this. In the beginning of RAIN, R, is to simply recognize whatever emotion is predominant right now. And it might be fear, or it might be anger, or it might be uh, shame, sadness. Just sense what's predominant. And if there's a few feelings predominant, just choose one that's calling to you for attention. And mentally whisper a word that might describe that. Again, just label the emotion. Fear, fear, anger, anger. And the A, allow, means just to let it be here for right now. Um, allow means that you're willing to not push it away or ignore it or judge it or think about it more, just to let it be here. I think of it often, I'll say the words, this belongs, just like waves in the sea. You know, it's just a wave that's here. It's okay. Just let it be there. And that allows you to do the I, which is investigate. And investigate is primarily in your body. So check your throat and your chest and your belly. And as you sense the worst part about this, what you're most upset about or what you're most afraid of, it's going to happen. Sense where that lives in your body. How does it feel? Is there a tightness in the throat? Is there a heaviness or squeeze in the chest? Is there like a, a fist clutching in the, in the gut? You know, just where do you feel it? And if you have a sense, it's helpful to put your hand there just to stay with your body. I often have my hand on my heart because I feel things very more viscerally there, but put your hand somewhere. And sense your willingness to feel it, to even invite the vulnerability forward to say, okay, it's okay to be here. And you might be reminding yourself of what triggers it and what you're really most afraid about or upset about and feel it in your body and even let your facial expression take on what that feeling is. And that'll help you get in touch with it. it might be a grimace, it might be a tightening in the jaw, your brows might come together, whatever it is, and feel again in your body where it feels the strongest. And you might sense even what you're believing. When, you're, when, when this situation's going on, what's the thing you're believing that's so upsetting? It might be that you're failing, somebody else doesn't care about you, you'll never be happy, something terrible is going to go wrong. And again, feeling, whatever you're believing, feeling it in your body. And see if you can now feel right to the epicenter of where there's the most vulnerability. Breathing with it. We begin to ask the deep question of, well, what does this place most need? How does it want me to be with it? What would be most healing for this place? What's the message? What's the experience that would most be healing? And as you ask that, just sense you're witnessing from the most compassionate part of your being so that now you can kind of send the message that's needed right through your hand into wherever you're feeling vulnerability. And the message might be to fear, thank you for trying to protect me, but I'm okay right now. That might be the way you nurture. It might be I'm here and I'm not leaving. Maybe what this place needs is forgiveness or acceptance or just understanding. Maybe it needs to feel embraced in love, in compassion. 
And if it's hard to offer it to yourself, then you might imagine someone you love. Just bring to mind someone you trust. Could be a grandparent, friend, or maybe it's a healer, therapist, spiritual teacher, or maybe it's your dog, maybe it's a pet, maybe it's a tree. Maybe it's a more for formless kind of awareness, but imagine this larger source gazing at you with love and bathing you now with care. Give yourself the gift of letting it in. We often don't do that, but let in the care. Let it in right to where there's vulnerability, fear, hurt. Imagine it washing through the cells and the spaces between the cells, kind of light and warmth just pervading you. And for these last few moments, notice the quality of presence that's right here. What's changed? Can you sense a shift from where you started as either an angry self or a fearful self to more resting in a kind of an awareness and tenderness, more spacious, more at home in who you truly are? This is what we call after the rain, just the way a, a real rain comes down and the gifts and the fruits are afterwards. You see it all, this world blossoming. So it is with the rain practice that you can start sensing the shift mm -hmm. in who you really are. Thank you. Oh, is there a bell? I'll, I'll... Just add a little <laughs> bit of fun to it. <laughs> I interrupted the bell. <laughs> oh, the bell and you came together in one. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hold myself with infinite compassion. <laughs> yeah, no, that <laughs> Thank was you, sweet. Thank you, Sarah. Thank yeah. you. That was beautiful. Um, I just want to highlight something here. Uh, the compassion that Tara is inviting us into isn't um, an escape from the pain. It isn't in spite of the pain. It's an embrace. She, she took us into the places that are wanting to be heard and held and loved not um not avoiding them and so if ever you feel like oh the world's too stressful i'm too messed up to have inner peace uh no and this is this is a practice of loving what is in you and eventually also in your world as is like absolutely as is um i um have, have a daily practice myself um which came about about 12 years ago um every day the, the messages help me to release all ambition all attachment and all desire for all that's not so mm. and help me to embrace totally with all that i am all that's real and mm. so i i take inventory of where am i holding it ambition attachment or desire for anything that is not so and i mean anything so this is an acceptance of what is because it's my experience that conflict with what is argument with what is brings suffering like no way around it it does there are a lot of things i don't like about the way the world is but there's some level of acceptance of that that also allows the response so part of what is is my capacity to say hey i don't like something that's going on and I get to be an agent of change. Like that is part of what is too, is the capacity to heal, to respond, to resourcefully regenerate. And so in that we find our power and it's a connected power. It's an integrated power rather than a disowning, dishonoring and agitated power. And uh, so when I, when I can truly do that, when I can say, okay, I want to embrace everything, including my capacity to change anything, then that's where I become more resourceful. I'm and, and right something there about that you. practice just landed me in that because I felt the places were like where I was scared and sad and hurting and I just loved those places. It didn't, not because my love was gonna make them go away, but just because. 
we love ourselves into healing and the healing is not to make the waves go away it's to come into a wholeness that has room for the waves yes and the beauty of it is that when we hold ourselves with that tenderness we become a tender openness that holds others it is the pathway to really holding others with a with an accepting loving heart mm, beautiful thank you we're nearing the end of our time here and so in a moment we're going to let tara go and i'm going to stay on and i invite you to stay on i'm going to tell you more about whole life club and what it can do to help you integrate all of this and your food life and your emotional life for your whole life because this isn't just about a moment it's about continuity our, you know our our moments of inspiration can shift the course of our destiny but it's our habits it's what we do day in and day out that that actually gets us to a new place you can change your direction and, that's great, but it's the steps you take in that new direction that get your results. And so Whole Life Club is about helping to steadily provide a wind at your back to help you sustain and follow through on all that you want for your life and for your health and for your wellness and for your peace and for your world. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that and about the opportunity that's here. But first, before that, I just wanna say, Tara, thank you so much. And do you have any final words you wanna share for this time together? Well, mostly I want to thank you for all the ways that you're serving and thank everyone who's listening because there really is a possibility of a path where out of care for this world, we take care of these bodies and hearts and each other. And that is really the trajectory of human consciousness. And may it be so. <laughs> may it be so. Thank you, thank yeah. you so That's much. We've been, we've been talking, sharing. I don't, I don't think it feels just like talking, but we've been, we've been communing with uh, Tara, Dr. Tara Brock, uh, psychotherapist, healer, mindfulness practitioner, mindfulness teacher, uh, voice of wisdom and peace in this time and in all time inspiration to millions and best-selling author of uh, multiple books including radical compassion and um uh, radical acceptance and do you have another one out even more recently i uh, know but between the two there was true refuge <laughs> true refuge okay got it yeah all right so and and more books to come i am sure you can find out more about her at tarabrock.com i believe is the best website yes um and i uh, thank you again so much tara Blessings, dear. Be Bless well. Bless you. Yeah. And now we're going to make our transition. So please stay on if you want to learn more about Whole Life Club and how you can take action to get results in your life. If you're already a member, there's no need to keep watching right now because you already are part of this and you know what it is and you know what it's doing for your life. But for everybody else who isn't already a member, you have an opportunity now to step in with a very special opportunity right now uh, that's just good through the end of day tomorrow. So every month in Whole Life Club, we've got a theme. It's kind of like a month-long course on that topic. We've had themes in the past like brain health, heart health, anti-cancer living, blood sugar balance, energy levels, lots of other topics, um, anti-inflammation, how to deal with stress. And with every month on that theme, you get an action hour with a guest expert, the opportunity to submit questions for that expert to answer that relate to your specific journey, and you also get a weekly collection of things. You get a weekly video from me with a specific short action of the week, some simple step you can take to keep making progress towards your goals. You also get another collection of five brand new, fabulous whole foods plant-based recipes that relate to that month's theme. So if we're looking at brain health, they're gonna feature ingredients that are good for your brain and so forth. You also get an action checklist with simple steps you can take to make progress towards the goals that we're focusing on that month and you get um, other specific resources, articles, videos that we suggest you may wanna to watch to learn more and go deeper. You also get uh, ongoingly community, web of relationships, peers, the chance to ask questions about whatever's going up and have our team there to support you and connect you and share resources that can help. And all of this is included in the Whole Life Club journey. And when you join now, you get something you never got before, which is our library. So you get our entire library. We've been doing this now for about a year and a half. So you get um, dozens of videos with action hour guests and action check action of the week videos and more than 400 recipes in the library now. And you can search through all of that. So you can search through the recipes to look for specific cuisines from around the world or featuring specific ingredients or omitting certain ingredients that may be allergens. 
Uh, you can look also at breakfasts and lunches and dinners and appetizers and snacks and desserts and everything is whole foods. Everything is plant-based. And uh, if there's any oil or sugar or salt used, then there are also suggestions and ways to do without that. So if you're SOS free, you get support on that too. But if you are transitioning or want a little bit of those things, some of the recipes include them, not excessive amounts, but small amounts so that we can help make this delicious and easy and accessible to as many people as possible. We conducted a survey recently where we asked Whole Life Club members who've been in the community for a little while what they were experiencing. And we heard from uh, most people were experiencing tremendous results, including losing weight, gaining more energy, um, having more continuity on their healthy eating path, getting off medications that they no longer needed because their health had improved, uh, having healthier social dynamics, feeling less lonely, feeling more connected in their food journey to peers that supported them, especially when times got tough. So if you can relate to wanting any of those kinds of results, then now may be an incredible time to help you step forward so that you can sustain this, so you can land the plane for your whole life. So we've been holding a series of action hours this week with Dr. Michael Clapper on Wednesday, with Dr. Neil Barnard on Friday, and now of course here today. And there's a whole new raft of people that are coming in and joining right now. So we opened the doors with an incredible offer this week only. It's a 40% savings off the regular annual price and it expires tomorrow. So if you feel motivated, inspired, you wanna put this forward in your life, now is an incredible time to say yes. And by the way, if you join in, you have two options. You can join in with a monthly membership or you can join in with an annual membership. Either way, you get a 60 day money back guarantee. So if you're not completely thrilled, if it doesn't knock your socks off, if you don't feel a total yes, it's easy to, to step out and say, you know what, that wasn't for me. And we will respectfully and lovingly say, thank you for giving it a try and give you a full money back. Because we don't want anybody in this program that isn't a yes to it. We want people who are ready and who are saying yes and who are able to step forward. If you want to step forward, if you want to wind at your back, then that's why we created this community, to help you make, make progress and get results and connect with others who are doing the same. Recently, I got to chat with one of our members, Genevieve from Ontario, Canada, and she said she wanted to share how a whole foods plant-based diet and other lifestyle changes that she made with support from Whole Life Club had impacted her life. Of course, these results are not typical. This is one person, but I wanted to let her bring her voice in here. So let's go ahead and roll the video so you can see what Whole Life Club and all of this journey has meant to Genevieve. Here we go. I'm Genevieve. Um... Genevieve in English, my friends call me Jen. I'm from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And where were you uh, in your life? Like what were the challenges you were facing before you joined Whole Life Club and, and found connected with this body of work? So before uh, joining Whole Life Club, um, about maybe a year before that, um, my health was bad, my whole everything wasn't good. When I was 16, I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism. And back in the late 90s, that was really rare. Uh, so I've been on this path to try to kind of get that resolved. And I saw a documentary on uh, veganism and how the industry, how it's uh, well, factory farming, which got me straight into veganism. Like I, I've been a vegan for two years now. And I struggled. I struggled to fit in with the crowds. I struggled to find meals. I struggled. I was alone. I felt really alone. So when I saw uh, the Food Revolution Summit, I was like, hey, people like me. And I was like, it's great. So I listened enthusiastically. And then that brought in more people. And that linked me to other documentaries and all that stuff. And then I grew my knowledge. And then the whole Life Club came about. And I was like, this is great. This is like-minded people who are supporting each other, whether they have taken that path to health or uh, they're looking to be on that path. So what I like about that is that there's a combination of the two, people who can offer support and offer tips 
but also people who are new that I can offer tips and support too, that I've been there and this is what I do. Maybe this will work for you. And of course I, I you know, uh, I absolutely enjoy your videos, your weekly videos. Uh, they're my, 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 pet, uh, my pep talks to keep me on that path. And to go back to your original question, um, my, my hypothyroidism, all the symptoms that I've had have gone away. Like I've reversed my hypothyroidism with the whole bucket list that comes along with that title in two years, I'm down to a quarter of the medication I used to take that I took for like 18 years. So that's why I love being part of this, this club because I know firsthand that when you change your diet, you change everything, all the ailments that you have, they go away. Wow, thank you. <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So uh, give me a snapshot of how your life is different with those symptoms uh, gone. How did, how, what, give me an example of some of the symptoms you were facing and what it's, how it's changed now. I, my, my biggest notice, it's really funny, but it's, it's hair. Like I, my hair was so thin, so dry, so brittle. Now I can grow long hair. I can, you know, I can be proud of my hair and not tie it back all the time. My nails, I couldn't grow nails for the life of me. And now I have to trim them every two weeks because they're so strong and so long that I'm scratching my daughter, you know, and it's, but it's little subtle things like that, that you don't notice. And, and you, you're like, well, okay, I have hypothyroidism. I can't grow nails. My hair falls out. I'm constantly tired. I brain fog. Brain fog has to be the biggest one. Uh, it creeps up on you and you just learn to live with it. And you wake up one day and it's gone and you're like, wow. I feel smarter, you know, but you're not smarter. You're just not bombarded by all these chemicals that are disrupting your brain's normal way of functioning. So that helps me be a better mom. I'm more focused at work. I get better sleep, which cycles into having more energy. Uh, and it all starts with good food. If you join Hoi Life Club, you will get the support that you need to be on the path to take control of your health. Thank you so much to Genevieve for sharing those inspiring words. I, I, I'm so moved, really. And now I wanna say this. If you are feeling inspired, like you might wanna implement what you're learning, if you might wanna take this forward into your life, then this right now is an opportunity to step forward. The doors are open for a very limited time this week only to join in for just for this huge savings. And now is an incredible time. If you're teetering on the edge, let me just say, listen to that still voice inside you and ask, is this a yes for me to step forward, to step forward into this next step in my life? And if it is, then we welcome you with open arms and open heart and celebration. Imagine the whole community. There are almost 10,000 people in Whole Life Club right now, everyone cheering for you saying, welcome. If it's a no, if you're not a yes, if you're like not feeling it, then bless you in finding what is your yes. No pressure here, just an open-hearted, open-spirited invitation to say yes to your health, to your well-being, and to mobilizing the resources inwardly and externally that will help you to sustain your wellness on your path. This has been an incredible week and I am th so thrilled to be here and to be sharing it all with you. If this inter interests you, then please check out Whole Life Club. And regardless, I just thank you so much for the gift of your attention, your love, your partnership in this food revolution and in this whole being revolution. Um, I'm feeling really moved right now from our time with Tara today. I hope you can feel it as well, transmitting from my heart to yours. I thank you. I bless you. I send love and peace and joy and wellness to you and to all you love. Wish you a fabulous day and hope to see you if you feel so moved in Whole Life Club. Let's do this. When it comes to cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease, and other chronic illness, what really matters isn't how many books you read, how many webinars you attend, or how much you know. What really matters at the end of the day is what you eat and how you live. The science has given us what we need to know. 
Now it's time for action. It's time to implement and optimize your healthy lifestyle. It's time to get results. It's time to say goodbye to confusion and hello to clarity. It's time to say goodbye to bad habits and hello to good ones. It's time to fall in love with foods that love you back. It's time to join a community that will support you in achieving your goals. It's time for Whole Life Club. Click the link to find out more and to join in now.